Okay, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, that's uh, the new beginning of our lunch seminar series. Uh, uh, as some of you might have heard, we have uh, upgraded our name. We are no longer simply the logic group at the University of Milan. We are now LUCI, uh, which is um, uh, an acronym for Logic, Uncertainty, Computation and Information Group, which we believe uh, besides uh, uh, expressing in uh, much more details uh, the type of uh, stuff that we do uh, with logic and uh, through logics. It's also a very nice acronym um, because, well, in Italian it means lights. Um, so let's uh, let's leave it there to sink in all of you. Um, but today we start our uh, lunch seminars again, and our first uh, speaker uh, is uh, Maria. Uh, so, yes, Lapkovic, uh, who is a uh, uh, full professor. Uh, last time that I checked, I thought she still was an associate, but she's now a full professor in uh, the Department of Information Science and Media Studies at the University of Bergen in uh, Norway. Um, uh, Maria has a background uh, much more in uh, MAS or multi agent systems. Uh, and then uh, uh, she and verification. So then she slowly transitioned into various other area of which uh, uh, machine uh, sorry multi agent systems are application of. So she 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 didn't change entirely her research area, but expanded it. I, I suppose it's fair to say. And uh, so now she uh, she's looking more into the application of uh, multi agent systems in the area of uh, machine ethics. Uh, which she will uh, uh, about which she will talk uh, today. Uh, so Maria, uh, floor is yours. Uh, this this is a uh, uh, we we like it to think of a very um, uh, lightweight uh, uh, seminar, uh, but we leave to the speaker the decision to be interrupted or not. Uh, so please. Uh, this, uh, let thank us you, Giuseppe. Like yeah, uh, the speaker That's welcomes yours. interruption. Uh, Thank you. So just, uh, I'm not necessarily going to see that you have raised your hands. So somebody please uh, just speak up because I don't see anything on the screen. Um, but I welcome questions and interruptions. It's better to handle them. It's nice to have a discussion and pretend like we really are in the same room together. So thank you for the Zoom attention. So just slight because I saw I saw Agatha Chiabatoni in the in the audience. I actually learned uh, foundations of mathematical logics oh. from Agatha. <laughs> thank you. Don't don't don't, don't exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> this, but um, I mean, that is actually, I was studying computational logic, then I go, went into more multi-agent system stuff and so on. And as Giuseppe said, I like to think as expanding things, the area of research rather than um, rather than changing it. And so what I'm going to talk today, I'm happy to, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit uh, nervous uh, talking to logic audiences because the slides are not very um, detailed in terms of technical details. And the reason that I don't have technical details on the slides is because it is very difficult to actually jam all of these different traditions and approaches that different people have done in machine ethics. Not that there is a lot of them, but uh, more um, uh, there is just everybody does their own thing. It's such a new field that there are no established practices. And then you know that, oh yeah, this is what people do. And then I can give you a technical introduction to the, to the technical side and then dive into the details. Also, it's one hour. So uh, what is machine ethics? Why is machine ethics? How does it uh, play with um, uh, AI ethics? This is a word that gets thrown around quite a lot. And uh, what do people actually do in machine ethics? And I thought it would be very interesting to talk to you about this because most of the approaches in machine ethics, unlike in AI ethics, I would say, are in fact formal based. So they are um, they are logic based, in fact, approach. So let's 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 look at that. So. Why first, why machine ethics, why AI ethics? Um, and this is my reasoning as to why it's completely my opinion and you can just uh, take it or you know develop your own opinions and argue with it. It's because um, the way we have, we are, the way computers are and the way we use them has changed. It seems like all of a sudden people started talking about ethics, whereas we have had AI for since 1956, 
and uh, people in the know. Last night I was actually talking to some wonderful ladies who have implemented uh, prolog programs and knowledge-based systems and so on in, in companies for practical applications. But yet somehow at that time there hasn't been any talk about you know, AI ethics or, or ethical issues or anything like that's not to the volume in which we have it today. So why today and why not at the time of the expert systems or even earlier in the 60s? Um, and the reason I think is because computers today interact without with other computer programs without human oversight. I have this picture on the left from the Polish analog computer from the 60s to just illustrate visually how computers have changed. So computers used to be a room that you enter, then they become this type of furniture, like you see here in the picture, then they became like an, an add-on stuff that but definitely identify where the computer is, where the computer program goes. You can just take the cable and follow it and say, well, like, okay, this is what the computer communicates with. But as computers got smaller and with the internet together, we now have a situation in which I don't know what is a computer and what it communicates with. And they're definitely, as we speak right now, there are probably like seven apps that are communicating without the apps. And I have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And then we have a situation where we have ambient computing. I mean, this is a word that doesn't exist. I just uh, kind of wondered where ambient intelligence went and why people stopped talking about it. But let's call ambient computing the situation in which you do not necessarily know that you're interacting with a computer or where the computer is. And what I mean by that is like people would be surprised that smartphones are computers. I think now they're catching on, but you know, your toaster can have a computer, your um, washing machine definitely has a computer. So, and if, when you connect everything to the internet, that all of a sudden becomes uh, a computer that is in a network that you know does what bullet point one says it does. And I think most importantly is that programs today, unlike before, before uh, 2010, I would say, are can be acquired and used by people without professional training. So that means that anybody can download a neural network, for example, and a, and a bunch of data, and then use train this train this neural network with this data and get some kind of a prediction model and then use it. And neither the people who collected the data nor the people who built the architecture uh, or the software library with this neural network uh, could have in any shape or form predicted what this would be used for. So the change here is I call this is we do not longer have a working envelope. We don't longer have um, a predictability of how this particular piece of software or particular device that has some smart capabilities will be used. And in the past, when you build a scheduling system for, I don't know, scheduling the trains in all of Germany, then you do it, a bunch of professionals do that for a specific company for a specific purpose. And all the parts in which this system could interact with users or impact society, uh, the effects of this were in a large effect predictable. And then you would deal with them before you deploy the system. Whereas in this situation in which everything is open world, you cannot predict anymore how things will be used. You can be certain that, you know, the street will find its own use for things. And so all of a sudden, then we, I have to be concerned about this new entity, uh, this um, AI or computing in general, if you like, and what impact does it have on people and what impact does it have on society? So AI ethics, I will start from there, is very much the field of the studies how to ensure that no negative ethical footprint uh, occurs of AI in society. And I will define later on what I mean by AI here. I'm not going to leave you with this AI uh, mythical being. So there are basically two approaches in which... Um, there are two approaches in which people go about ensuring that no negative ethical footprint is, exists of society. And the first approach is to ensure that uh, we as people or entities of society, stakeholders, forums, whatever you want to call us, we have enough control. Uh, we have the tools to measure the performance. We have the tools to measure the impact uh, of uh, any particular system that is being built. So we know what we are measuring, we know what we need to be concerned about, and we know what we can do about it. And here, so this is why I have this illustration with the you know, puppet, that we want to AI to be the puppet that we have firmly under our control, and it does what 
it, what is intended, that there are no intended, unintended uses, consequences. We, we understand what happens to a society or the person's life when you put some kind of an AI system in the picture. And people here talk about responsible AI. They talk about accountability. Responsible AI can be used either as a synonym for AI ethics, or it can be used as um, uh, be responsible when you research, develop, or implement AI. You know, then we talk about accountability, transparency, explainability, fairness, privacy. And another word that you have been hearing probably is, is trust. Now, this tutorial is about the other approach. To a very large extent, uh, artificial intelligence can be seen, and I think this is a definition by Bellman, Yes, as the field who studies um, who studies the automation of tasks that involve human intelligence. So, if we take artificial intelligence to automate tasks that involve human intelligence, and, and if we take that moral reasoning in deciding right and wrong, positive and negative impact is uh, positive and negative choices and decisions and so on. That that activity in its own is a type of activity that requires intelligence, then we can then look at how can we automate moral reasoning and moral intelligence. And this is what we do in machine ethics. Machine ethics is concerned with the behavior, the ethical behavior of um, AI systems themselves um, in when they are exit, while they are doing the tasks that it is their primary goal or duty to do. So it's concerned with the behavior of machines towards human users and other machines. So this definition is from a paper from 2006, uh, which, yes, ha, I have it. Um, and um, a lot of interesting resources, both on these two topics, you can find in this link that this is down below from a summer, spring, AAAI symposium. All right, so uh, what I'm going to go, go now from here on is I'm going to focus on machine ethics only, and I will leave you uh, uh, be with respect to all of these exciting things that people talk a lot about, which is accountability, transparency, explainability, fairness, privacy. I gave a tutorial this yesterday, no, day, day before yesterday at this Humane AI school here in Berlin. So very much I spoke only about that left side and I'm sure that that, that lecture will surface one point or another. So you can look it up as well if you want to know more about that side. So now let's talk about machine ethics. Machine ethics has uh, two interpretations, I would say. So in an essence, it's concerned with the behavior of machines towards human users and other machines, okay? But then there is, um, the interesting topics that computer scientists study in it, and there are the interesting topics that philosophers, humanists, and social scientists can study in it. And uh, we have on the blue side what uh, the interesting problem is for computer scientists, and on the red side what the interesting problem is for philosophers. So for computer scientists, this is very much the practical question of how do I automate moral reasoning? But because we are dealing with very ephemeral concepts of right and wrong, we're dealing with theories of moral reasoning that are, well, for lack of a better word, not algorithm, well, algorithms. And how do we take something that is a very vague description of right and wrong and build a computer program that implements it? Right? That's a very hard technical problem. And on the other side, we are asking a very a much more basic question, which is what ethical theory, if any, should be implemented by machine ethics? Now, what is right and wrong? How do we reason about right and wrong is the subject of moral philosophy, various branches of moral philosophy. And so there people have studied um, what moral theories are and uh, what moral principles are and how do we guide this choice between actions that should be motivated by doing the right thing or choosing the right thing. And uh, very all of these 2,000 years plus of uh, moral philosophy, they all have one thing in common, and that is that they are all built having the human as the main um, agent, as the moral agent, as the one that is making the decisions and the one that is doing the reasoning. Now, what happens if I take a moral theory from moral philosophy, anyone, and I pluck out that human and put in, in there something that is not quite at the level of intelligence or autonomy or capabilities or perceptions as human. So then the question is, 
what does ethic moral philosophy look like then when I change the agent, when I'm dealing with machines and not humans? And this is also very much a problem that people study in machine ethics as well. So now I think I will mainly then uh, diverge into, this is like a decision tree, these slides. Uh, now we go into the blue slides again. So I'm keeping it right, I keep going right. So to, to study how we can go about um, automating moral reasoning and moral decision-making, we need to kind of have a little bit of a closer look of what the decision-making here is. So what is the decision-making process? So decision-making, is a process that consists of list, at least four steps. So the first one is to identify the problem for which a decision needs to be made. So I'm hungry, I wanna do something about it. Uh, what, uh, so I need to decide what I wanna do about being hungry. So then I have to evaluate the objective and preferences that apply. So do I need to just satiate my hunger or do I want to have a gastronomical experience? Do I want to you know, have an adventure? Do I want to have a social event? What it is that it is important to me when I choose how to address my problem of being hungry. Um, then the third step is to analyze the problem and its constraints and develop or identify the possible options from which to choose. So I would have, for example, okay, I'm hungry. I would like a solution to that hungry, that means I eat within the next hour. So that's a constraint. Um, and so then I don't have any food in my dwellings and I need to purchase this food. So um, do I want uh, to uh, hot food or cold food? If I want hot food, that means that I, there is a limited amount of places from where I can choose to eat. So it could be a constraint. I don't eat, for example, I don't know, Japanese food. I do, but for the sake of the example. Um, so then I constrained away these options, those options, and I'm left with a list of options that each of them have their own properties um, that, that I can compare them by. And then the last step is to choose from this identified list of options following some type of reasoning. So the reasoning here could be I assign utilities or some kind of a cost benefit to all of these options, and then I just maximize them, the one that uh, has the highest utility, or or minimize the lowest cost, or I can uh, do some kind of a different type of reasoning. I can have a whole argumentation graph, for, for example, and say, well, okay, these are the arguments pro choosing this, these are the arguments con choosing this, and then you know, all kinds of all kinds of different things that could be constituting reasoning. Now, what does it mean? That is what it means to make decisions, but what does it mean to make moral decisions? So a moral decision is a choice made based not only on the factual objective preferences and constraints, as I identify them, but also based on a person's or society's consideration of what is moral behavior and what that actually means. In essence, this is a quote by Hara, I think. Uh, moral decisions must also include the interests of others as of equal weight with one's own or, you know, as of some weight compared to one's own. So I'm not only choosing based on satisfying uh, my own criteria and constraints, but I also take into consideration how my choice impacts other people. And then I want to uh, have uh, either neutral impact or non-negative impact of my choice. So, you know, if I were some kind of a cannibal, then uh, somehow then choosing to, you know, eating people would be part of my option set, but then it would get, then get out of the option set because that impacts other people and has consequences and so on. Bad example. So why do we actually care about automating moral decisions? And the reason for that is because uh, in a lot of this, let me go back a couple of slides, in a lot of these steps of decision-making, there, um, there is computation that comes into play. So not necessarily in identifying the problem, perhaps not even in evaluating in the, uh, uh, the objective and preferences that apply, but definitely in selecting a list of subselecting or narrowing down a list of options and maybe even following some reasoning to choose from a, a smaller set from these options or the option itself. So there are a lot of devices that, that do do that for us that um, give us a, a limited list of options from which we actually then choose from. Like for example, when you do a search, you do not you necessarily, cannot see all of the search results. If you do a search of a term online, you cannot see all of the search results. And uh, necessarily the, the same way that you cannot actually write a set 
the set is a, a set is a very um, abstract concept that you cannot materialize because whenever you try to write it down, you're actually going to choose a list and you write that list, you don't write the set. So in the same sense, I cannot write a list of options in any kind of an unbiased, undiscriminative way. Uh, the, the search engine will choose the list. So then the question is, what should the search engine do when they are choosing? Are these choices that have to take the consideration of our others? And I would argue, yes, sometimes, and this is just one example of automating decision-making. It's not all there is to it. Sometimes, um, this choice of what you're going to be presented with has an impact on your well-being, on the well-being of other people. So the stupid example that I like to use here is uh, if I have Alexa and I want to ask a stupid question, factual question, who wrote 1984? It is pretty clear that there is a set of options. Uh, but there is only one decision to be taken uh, if the constraint is factuality. And that is George Orwell. So George Orwell wrote 1984. Now, if I ask the same device a question of how do I kill myself, um, then there are several different options. So the factual option here would be um, having a list of different methods ranked in some way or by how little they are, how much time it takes and so on. But then the question is like, okay, hang on, this is the, is this the answer that I... I, I, the search engine should give. And um, if I am a person, why am I asking this question? So if I'm a person that is vulnerable at the moment or generally, and I'm just considering acting upon this and I want information in order to harm myself, and that is not of the best interest for me and it's not the best interest in society, of the best interest in society. So perhaps the answer there should not be factual, but it should be, you know, something else. On the other hand, I could be, you know, a new crime writer and I'm actually looking for information that is important for my book. Um, and I have phrased it in this weird way. Then uh, it is a limitation on my autonomy and freedom if the device does not give me the answer, but it actually tells me, please contact this number. Uh, it's a helpline, right? So it's not very easy to figure out uh, what the right answer is, but we can agree that this device is a moral arbiter. It does choose for you um, and it should act in a way that it not only takes into consideration, in some situations, not only takes the, into consideration the uh, constraints and objectives and preferences of um, the, the problem itself, but the well being of others. So, machine ethics is very much a problem of how to reason in a morally sensitive context. And what we want is we want to build this box. We want a moral reasoning algorithm that takes on input some information about contexts and options, maybe abilities, constraints, preferences, all that stuff. It also takes on input uh, information of moral character. What does it mean to take into consideration the will of others? What does it mean to do good? What does it mean to do harm? What does it mean right? What does it mean wrong? What are the duties, perhaps? What are the values that you want to follow? And we want to put build this box, and then out of here comes moral choice in the right time. So at the right time, when the machine is engaged in decision making, so for some particular Questions, for example, if this is your search engine for some particular questions, it takes into consideration the uh, other issue, other things, not just preferences and goals and constraints. So, um, uh -huh, hang on, um, ignore this left. Okay, let's let's do it in the order in which I have built the slides. Now, uh, if you think about it a little bit, and particularly if you hang around with non-computer scientists, um, then sooner or later, somebody will say, well, I mean, who gets to decide what is the right thing to do? What are the moral values to follow? What are the moral obligations to follow? Um, is it the people who write the laws? Is it the people who are from, you know, this moral persuasion or this theological persuasion? Is it ethicists, uh, who, who gets to decide? And after like five minutes of this kind of a discussion, you realize that, well, you know what, it's actually impossible to find one, one unique stakeholder or one unique agent that should make that decision. And probably it's going to be some kind of a forum or some kind of a committee in the best case scenario that has, has the right and should provide input to this 
this decision. So then I would say we have also the task of building a second box that somehow puts into con uh, if this if this committee is somehow to dynamically give input or to be able to react um, in any kind of a direct way, uh, then we need a second box that uh, that resolves types of conflicts between their opinions, between the values, between obligations in some way. So that I would say is also the object of machine ethics, but uh, let's say there is a consensus about this box and this box is, uh, we, are, we are getting there. Now, uh, when I talk about, when anybody talks about moral reasoning and automating moral reasoning and automating decisions that have moral impact, then what people think about is uh, uh, these uh, trolley problems, driverless cars, driverless boats, whatever, that uh, whose brakes fail and then you have to either kill the passengers uh, or uh, of that are in, sorry kill pedestrians that are right in front of you or swerve and somehow go into the valley and kill the pe passengers of the car and uh, that is a little bit of a disservice to the whole field i mean it is exciting to think about these problems where people have not solved them um, but this is not what machine ethics is about machine ethics is about much simpler problems which you already see where you have for example um, a social media platform and we are in a situation where there is a crisis like COVID and it is very damaging for a particular type of messages and disinformation to be enhanced by the social network visibility algorithms and so on. And uh, you want to have, because of the sheer volume of information that is exchanged, you want to have some kind of an automated system that decides that this information is true this information is false. This information is false, but harmless. It's a joke, sarcasm, whatever, but this other information harms others. So you have to take into consideration in these visibility algorithms, they have to take into consideration the, the choice that they have. Should I increase the visibility of this or not? Follow the formula that tells how visible this piece of uh, info, uh, post should be, or should I suppress the visibility because it harms others? So something like misleading information can be labeled or removed, a disputed claim can be labeled, or there should be a warning next to it, or uh, if there is an unverified claim, there should be no action. These choices, what to do with this questionable, possibly questionable information, are in fact moral choices that some kind of an algorithm needs to make, which makes that problem a machine ethics problem. So uh, in order to be able to kind of go into approaches, uh, general level, how people go about automating moral reasoning, let's have an agreement on what artificial intelligence is. So this is the definition. Uh, Bellman defined artificial intelligence as the automation of activities that we associate with human thinking, so namely cognitive activities. Um, in AI, the automation of cognitive activities has proceeded in separation, which is uh, sometimes we, they call this narrow AI, which means that we don't actually automate intelligent behavior. What we automate is learning specifically, representation specifically, um, reasoning specifically, uh, interaction, and so on. Uh, I have two pushes here. So machine ethics pushes us to consider the artificial agent as a whole instead. So another alternative definition of AI is to consider that AI is about, uh, what is it? Um, synthesizing and analyzing um, intelligent agent behavior. And this is what we want, in fact. In effect, we want intelligent agents. We don't just want these cognitive tasks in separation. And when we are talking about making automated moral reasoning, we are being now pushed back away from this ability to solve tasks as separating these different cognitive tasks, because I need to consider several things at the same time in order to automate moral reasoning. So, so let's Maria, talk a little. Sorry, yeah? sorry. I, uh, just to clarification, you are suggesting that there is a. Uh... No, don't want to say contradiction, but there is a, 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 a um, divergence between uh, the view of narrow AI and what machine ethics underpins. Is that what you're saying? No, no, not at all. Not at all. I'm saying that a practical AI, for all intents and purposes, the, the devices, the systems that we have, they are narrow AI, right? And uh, although the in the core of AI is to build 
um, intelligent agents, right? We don't actually necessarily build agents, not in the moral sense of the world, sorry, not in the philosophical sense of the world. But what I'm suggesting is that uh, you cannot just, it, uh, machine ethics actually pushes you to put reasoning together with uh, something else, right? Together with uh, learning, together with um, natural language processing. So these are things that, of course, AI as, as a field is trying to put together as well. But there is the research and then there is practically practical applications and practical applications often find workarounds that it is not any kind of controversial statement that I'm trying to make. Um, I don't know if that answers your questions, but yes, yes, thanks. Okay, okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about about agents because when you say uh, I need to make a moral decision, then some agent is making that decision, and uh, the automation of moral decision making is around building agents, taking the agency into account when you are doing this thing. So agents are a very confusing thing. Uh, they're not confusing when you are in the AMAS community, everybody knows what you're talking about, but then you step a little bit around and then uh, it becomes confusing because terms from humanities like trust, agent, moral and uh, agent, intention, autonomy, will, control, choice, they don't have the same meaning as they do in AI. And this is particularly true about agency because when I say I want to build an agent that is capable of moral reasoning, uh, people get seriously upset, like, oh, yeah, but you want the machines to tell us what to do and to machines to tell us what is right and wrong. And this is absolutely not what we want in machine ethics, right? We want uh, we want just that this the particular decision-making program sometimes takes into account some other factors than the preferences and the constraints. And that is a, seems trivial from the viewpoint of moral philosophy, but it is very much not trivial from the view, viewpoint of computer science. So just to be clear, in, uh, in AI, an agent is an entity that is able to act, that has some abilities, goals, and preferences that come from somewhere maybe, that has some prior knowledge that also may come from somewhere, has the ability to take some actions upon an environment and then observe the effects of those actions on the environment, incorporate them with their knowledge and use them in order to uh, make decisions how to best achieve its goals. So that's in a very, very broad stroke term what, um, what an agent is. This definition and the picture come from the book, which I didn't, I'm not having a reference on it, but uh, just Poole and Macworld 2017 actually brings you to the book. So that is what I understand under agent here. And then the second question is, what do we understand under autonomy? So now autonomy, again, is a different beast in philosophy and in uh, autonomous systems. So in autonomous systems, we, we call them autonomous systems, but in fact, we have some very specific categories of systems in mind. And it is not about true autonomy, but it is about self-governance, but it is about control. It's not about self-governance, it's about uh, being how much you are able to do without a human being there to, to kind of control. So uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering distinguishes between four categories of autonomous systems to just to get an idea of what is autonomy here. Control systems where humans have full or partial control, such as an ordinary car. Supervised systems, which do what an operator has instructed, such as program plot or other industrial machinery. This is this, you know, you put a chunk of wood, you jam it between these two things, and then after five minutes, you get a beautiful goblet. That's a laugh. That's what it does. Then you have automatic systems that carried out fixed functions without the intervention of an operator, such as an elevator. And then you have autonomous systems, which is very, very, very undefined field that are adaptive, learn, and can make decisions. But again, this is not human level autonomy. This is a satellite or a rover on Mars that is able to uh, execute a series of actions, change uh, the behavior and the actions that's going to execute based on what it perceives without any human control, because human control is not possible. So basically, the difference is um, an iron, a toaster would be a supervised system. You put in the bread and then you walk away and it pushes it out after the right time. And then you have a washing machine is an automatic system, actually, uh, particularly this kind where you can have a, a tank for a washing powder that the washing machine determines itself how much it takes from the washing powder. And then, I mean, the autonomous system, we're talking curiosity here, <laughs> basically. Um, that's the source. Um, 
about, uh, oh yeah, no, that's the link that discusses specifically perseverance on Mars and how much autonomy it has and all that stuff. And you can see how the terminology is being mixed even, even there. Uh, so what you specifically would know that uh, for driverless cars, which is what people think about when somebody says autonomous systems, you have five, no, six levels from no fully manual to fu fully autonomous. And the cars do exist. Uh, this is uh, the link in the bottom is actually a very nice link towards, uh, it tells you which cars have which level of autonomy. Uh, where do I have it? Ah, yes, there it is. So no automation, then some driver's assistance, partial automation, conditional automation, how, high automation and full automation, right? And then we say this full has autonomy. This. So I'm just going to leave you with the link. If somebody is into cars, they can look it up. So having this in mind, then we are asking, okay, so agents have limited capabilities and then they have limited, these computational agents, uh, intelligent or otherwise, they have limited capabilities um, and then they have limited abilities for autonomy. So then we want them to have the power to make or ability to make some types of moral decisions. So what does that mean? And obviously an agent that has very little autonomy will have very different, uh, it means differently to make moral decisions for that agents than some agent who has a lot of autonomy. So people were thinking about, okay, what can we expect at all in terms of moral decision-making based uh, with respect to the abilities? So Wallach and Allen in their Moral Machines book, actually, there is an article that predates the book. They distinguish between several different levels of moral agency um, with respect to um, autonomy so uh, and ethical sensitivity. So they distinguish between operational morality, so the white is no morality whatsoever, they, but then you have operational morality, functional morality, and full moral agency. And for them, operational morality is accomplished by an, a computational agent when the moral significance of the actions of the agent lies entirely in the human involved. So the human decides what is right and wrong decision in a particular context, and your computational agent just implements that. It's basically to the agent, is there is no difference. There is a box uh, and another box, and if your choice is in this left box, take it. If it's a choice is in the right box, you just you know avoid it. And then the next level would be functional morality. This is the ability of an artificial moral agent, that's what AMA is, to make moral judgments when deciding a course of action without direct instructions from humans. So there is no box of good and bad, but there are some kind of tools like rules or, or, um, or goals or preferences that are defined by the human. And then the machine uh, uses them to figure out by itself what the right thing to do is. But then it's not free either. I mean, it has to follow these constraints of right and wrong or rules or, or targets or functions or whatever you, you have given there. And they, of course, have full moral agency, and that is same level of moral agency of as human, whatever that means. And pretty much the same system we find in a, uh, this paper or by uh, Moore, which called The Nature, Importance, and Difficulty of Machine Ethics, which I highly recommend to read uh, because it's a very simple, very short paper, but it kind of gives you a very good idea of what this is all about. And more than distinguishes between four levels of uh, moral, artificial moral agents. And he has ethical impact agents, implicit ethical agents, explicit ethical agents, and full ethical agents. Now, full are basically the same as with Bauer and Allen. This is human level moral agency for whatever that means. And the interesting ones are the other three. So ethical impact agents are agents that do what agents do. Uh, and again, all the time I'm talking about computational agents, uh, but uh, because they exist, they change uh, they, they change the world. They somehow become moral arbiters or they become a moral factors that change the ethical milieu. And the example that Moore gives is um, with uh, camel racing in Qatar, where uh, camels, camel races are a big thing and there's a lot of money involved. And in order to have a fast camel, you need to have a very light rider, which there is nothing lighter than a little boy. So this camel racing affinity has propelled slave trade with um, little boys from Sudan who were sold in order to jockey camels. 
But after our robot jockey was invented, uh, that invention, basically the existence of this robot jockey, which was far better at jockeying a camel than a little Sudanese boy, slave boy, um, it eliminated the need for slavery in this aspect altogether. So it had an ethical impact that robot, even though it did not engage in making morally sensitive decisions. And I would say that having, for example, a, a mobile phone with a sensor that has that is detects proximity or with a camera that you can't switch off changes the the, the moral milieu of, uh, of, of the world, but in a quite a different way. You can't quite see it as clearly as there is slavery today, there is no slavery tomorrow. And it's not necessarily in a positive way either, right? So on one hand, you have uh, mobile devices that are, as you can see, we have stepped away from AI a little bit even. You have moral devices that, uh, sorry, you have mobile devices that have cameras and that uh, in, uh, enables citizens citizen activism. So when you see um, a person of authority abusing that authority, you can record it and that becomes a good thing. But on the other hand, if that camera can be switched on without your knowledge and record you with, uh, in, a, in a situation which you consider is private, and then somehow that footage is used to scrutinize your behavior that you thought you were doing in private, then it becomes a negative thing. But in either way, it, it has an impact. So those are ethical impact agents, not subject to machine ethics. The interesting ones for machine ethics are implicit and explicit ethical agents, because that's when we built in moral reasoning. And by these pictures, you can uh, figure out uh, what, what it is that they do. Implicit ethical agents, they're very much like operational morality. Sorry, I keep forgetting. Yes, operational morality, namely. They, their actions are constrained by a particular set of prof, uh, preferences or constraints or, ob or obligations or duties or whatever you want to put them, rules um, that say, do this type, do, do, uh, you're allowed to do actions that have this of, of this type or satisfy these prerequisites, but you're not allowed to do actions that satisfy other prerequisites. So the agent itself, even if it is capable of some level of autonomy, cannot actually use that autonomy to choose for itself what is right or wrong, but just follows the directions of uh, some human or, or manufacturer or government organization. In contrast, explicit ethical agents, they do may not have a lot of autonomy, but they do have some kind of a toolbox of ability to do reason out by themselves what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. So machine ethics is about building explicit and implicit ethical agents. And of course, both of these things actually come with their own sets of challenges and advantages that we can we can see. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kandu. Oh. I have a non-disturb, but you know, nobody ever reads the non-disturb. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, Implicit uh, and explicit ethical agents, they all come, they both come with their own sets of, you know, advantages and disadvantages when it comes to actually executing them. And I will go into, into both of this. Uh, full ethical agents, we don't talk about that. That We don't talk about capital. Okay. So there are, again, two approaches. And this is not to be dichotomous, but to just be organizational. Obviously, there are more than two approaches, right? But we are just trying to, to think about things in some kind of a constructive way. So top-down and bottom-up approach to building artificial moral agency. This, again, is an idea that uh, cropped up in the paper by Valach, Allen, and Smith. And um, uh, this is not something that they invented. It, typically, in engineering, whenever you do some kind of a problem solving, there are two approaches to solving the problem, either to go top-down or bottom-up. So what does that mean in terms of building explicit and implicit uh, moral agents. So in engineering, the top-down approach means that um, you take the problem and then you uh, iteratively divide it into smaller and smaller and smaller problems until you get problems that can be solved with a particular action that you know how to do. So for instance, my problem is I don't, uh, I, I don't know how to, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I want to make a, I want to make a, okay, so Pasta carbonara, sorry, not, not Mamila uh, example. 
Uh, and then the question is, how do I do that? Well, I don't know how to make carbonara, but um, do I know how to, to how to cook pasta? Yes. Okay. So it involves cooking pasta and then putting into the cooked pasta this sauce. So how do I make this sauce? This is a mixture of egg and uh, and cheese. So then I need to, to get the mixture of egg and cheese. I need to break the eggs and scramble them perhaps. And I have to take the cheese and grind the cheese. And do I know how to do that? Yes. So then I have broken down the carbonara making process into a set of activities that I know exactly how to do and in which order to do them. So that's the top-down approach. In machine ethics, what does it mean? It means that I take a particular ethical theory from moral philosophy and I figure out how to implement it. And when I say implement it, I mean for a particular purpose in a particular context. Nobody says implement ethical theory for the whole world here, just to be clear. So for explicit agents, the question then becomes, how can we build the agent to follow a given moral theory? So how do I represent the, this moral theory altogether in a way that an agent can follow it? And how can I then build an agent that follows it? And for implicit agents is how can we follow a given moral theory to build the agent itself? In a way. So what is the difference? The difference is the expert agent can implement the moral theory and then use it to choose between right and wrong. Whereas for implicit agents, me as a human, I follow the moral theory to decide what the right action box and the wrong action box has and that, that the agent can choose from. So that's the, that's the difference. Okay, so now I have a long list of types of moral theories because um, I use these slides with students. I use them to teach machine ethics in a course I gave last semester. And this is particularly for people who have never heard of moral philosophy or know what it is. And I don't think this is this audience, so I'm just going to skip the slides. And I assume that you have some knowledge of what utilitarian theories are, deontic theories are, and so on. Uh, uh, let me see. Okay, so just to be of an interest, I think, uh, what does it mean to use consequentialist theories uh, in order to build explicit and implicit agents? So one very famous, I, I pick, I will just pick these guys and maybe go into the ontological theories. Consequentialist theories are very important because everybody somehow has in their mind this idea of a robot that weighs uh, I robot, right? With the movie with Will Smith, uh, uh, it weighs the the utility, the benefits and costs of everything, and then uses them in order to uh, measure carefully how much good each of the action brings into the world, how much bad each of the impossible action brings into the world, and then compares them in, in a perfect way and and has this very cold moral decision. So just to dissuade people that this is not as, as easy as it is in iRobot. Uh, utilitarianism is the, the most famous of the consequentialist theories. And uh, consequentialist theories in general, they say, well, an action is right if the consequences of the action are right. So what you, in order to determine the goodness or the badness of an action, you have to look at its consequences. So something may look like a bad thing to do, but if the consequences are good, then that makes it a good thing to do. Very wishy-washy moral philosophy. So utilitarianism then is the theory that asserts that the moral, morally right action is the one that produces the most favorable balance of good over evil ever everyone consider. And then you have act utilitarianism and you rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism looks at the consequences of each choice that you need to take, whereas rule utilitarianism, um, it's looking at kind of finding some kind of rules of thumb that if I follow this rule, then the consequences will be good. Therefore, this is a good thing to do. So the initial problem of why it is difficult to implement utilitarianism for either explicit or implicit moral agents, both is because it is very difficult to measure goodness and badness of actions or consequences of consequences of consequences and so on. So it's difficult to measure things, goodness, badness, and it's difficult to identify consequences. So you can do it in a way, in a, in a very close system where you can predict what's going to happen. And then you can very nicely use utilitarianism. But if you are building a, a, a machine that needs to reason morally, you're following utilitarianism. When you can't tell how the world is going to change, what this machine will encounter, then it becomes very difficult. 
Uh, so there is a very nice paper um, by James Gibbs, uh, which in detail analyzes the necessary abilities that uh, consequentialist robots can, must have in order to be able to use con consequentialist theories, utilitarianism included. And of course, this applies not only for robots, but for software as well. So what you would need to accomplish this is a way of describing the situation in the world, a way of generating possible actions, a means of predicting the situation that would result if an action were taken given the current situation, and a method of evaluating a situation in terms of its goodness or desirability. And if you have uh, been around with AI for many years, or if you have followed what is known as a classical education in AI, then you would recognize a lot of very classical problems in AI in this list. So these are very, very hard problems that AI has not solved since 1956. Uh, so uh, let's just summarize and say it's hard. Uh, when it comes to theories of obligation, the idea is that um, uh, we are looking at not what the consequences an action has, but the action itself, the choice itself. And we say, well, some of these actions can do good. So I should not really skip slides and then try to get back into the slides. So I will assume the knowledge of the ontological theories uh, and specific, say, specifically just say what the challenges of implementing them are. So, uh, no, this is still describing it. Ah, there we are. Okay, so what are the limitations and advantages of building top-down explicit agents following either moral theory of your choice, whether you like it or you don't like it? So the limitations are that moral theories are very often idealistic standards that are hard to meet even by people, which means that if I want to use a particular moral theory to build either an explicit or an implicit um, agent, I have to specify it. And I can only do that if I narrow down the context in which it will apply. So if I can do that, then I can use a moral theory to build either an impact or an, sorry, either an explicit or an implicit agent. Uh, in order to use them generally, then I would need to solve hard AI problems such as situational awareness, prediction of consequences. Then there is the framing problem. There is this other classical problem that now it just that slipped my mind. But yeah, it requires pushing AI further. And personally, I like doing machine ethics because of this. It, we are pressed against, they, what do they say? The, 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 the devil and the deep blue sea, there is a saying. And we have to advance AI in order to advance this type of uh, programs. Uh, there is a very high context dependency due to the high AI requirements, but also to the idealistic standards that are the moral, moral theories. And then, of course, there is the meta-ethical question of which theory should be used at all, right? Should we be using utilitarianism? Should we be using Kantian ethics? Should we be using virtue ethics? What, what is it that we should be using in order to build our, our computational agents? And that is not a question for computer scientists. Advantages are very many. Uh, there are no surprises. The agent follows a tried and tested theory, so we know what to expect. Some Somebody has said, somebody very careful, many somebodies who know what they're talking about has said, this is the right way to reason between choices with respect to how they affect the world or people. This is the good, bad. That's what we should do. So as a computer scientist, you can just implement it and you know you're doing the right thing. And the other very, very, very strong advantage is that the behavior, the moral behavior of the computational agent can be verified. We can check if the, in the, in the, in the strict, strict uh, formal verification sense. We can check if the action of the agent complies with the theory recommendation for the given situation. And we can do that before we deploy the agent. So there are no surprises. We can, we are fully in control. So then the question is why look further away? Why, um, okay, so the, 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 the okay, so top, um, uh, the top down approaches have different, uh, strengths and limitations for implicit and for explicit agents. For implicit agents, uh, the, the implicit agents do not use their autonomy to make choices, um, and they require a predetermined set of rules. Uh, so everything must be predictable. I already said that. And um, 
it is actually very easy to use um, to to it may appear to be very easy to use um, moral theories in an implicit way because well you say okay um, everything is predictable I know what I need to do I have to implement everything and it's fine but there is one one thing to think about that is you have to make sure that all the necessary rules are accounted for that you really have thought of everything and predicted everything and then it's not always easy there is not always an algorithm to follow to make sure that you have thought of everything and of course you have fully verifiable and transparent agents um, the previous was, uh, the top down for explicit agents, limitations, and advantages. Sorry, I should, I didn't clarify that. My attention slipped. Okay, so um, that is how you go about top down solving, um, well, approaching to build implicit and explicit agents. And there are examples among the papers that do both of these things. Now, I want to say something a little bit about normative reasoning that comes into play when we are talking about this type of stuff. Reasoning about norms has a long tradition in logic in AI. The ontic logic specifically studies how to represent and reason with statements uh, about obligations and permissions. Uh, you have five normative statuses, uh, and uh, we in, in, in the ontic logic, you try to represent what is obligatory to do, what is permissible to do, impermissible, omissible, optional, and then there is a way in which you can derive what is um, you don't need uh, you don't need to represent the language in the language. Each of these you can represent only two, and then as primitive and the other ones you get. Um, I would like to bring your attention to this paper of of Jeff Horty, Moral Dilemmas in Non Monotonic Logic, as a nice consideration of how people used to think about in the nineties, the golden age of KR in many respects, how they used to talk, think about what should be done. And uh, how do we automate the reasoning and decision making in light of obligations and duties and permissions? And very much this work has to do with machine ethics. The difference is that not all norms are ethical norms. Right? So some norms are not about ethics. And then the question is whether it makes a difference to all this work that has been done in the ontic logic whether the norm, the permission, the obligation, and so on, is about an ethical issue or not. Um, and this is not something that the field or anyone that I know uh, has a clear answer about. So there is, of course, a long tradition of normative reasoning and of the own logics, but the connection with machine ethics is not one to one. There are parts of normative reasoning in the ontic logic that are do not pertain to ethics. And the question is which parts do, which parts don't. Maybe we find out that all of normative reasoning work that has been done actually is applicable in for ethical norms or ethical reasoning or moral theories, but we just don't know at the moment. Uh, why do I have this slide here? Hang on. Okay, so uh, let's um, Let's then look at the, the bottom-up the bottom approach, the different approach. So the other way to solve problems is instead of uh, taking the problem and breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces until you reach a piece that you can solve. I see there is a chat message here. Hang on. All right. Uh, bye. <laughs> Sorry for um, taking it too long. Let me try to... Ah, no. All right. Let's go back. All right, so the other approach, instead of doing the, 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 the top down, you can do bottom up. That means you describe the solution, not how to reach it. And then uh, this is very much dif uh, the difference between procedural and uh, declarative programming, if you like, the top down and bottom up in programming that, refl that uh, is reflected in bottom up, uh, sorry, in uh, procedural and declarative. So procedural would be top down and declarative would be bottom up approach. So instead of instead of uh, saying, okay, follow this, do this, do this, do this, uh, in order to attain moral behavior or moral decision making, we say, well, this is what it means. This is what the good is. This is what bad is. So uh, whatever you're doing, try to land here. So in machine ethics, that for now, very much means training an agent to behave morally in some way, right? So if I were to 
uh, to aha that's um, that's why I had this previous slide. Um, there are two ways to clean a floor. floor don't, never mind the text. There are two ways to clean a floor using a, a device. One way is to actually uh, have a smart machine like a Roomba, the smarter of the Roombas, not the stupider of the Roombas. Have a smart machine that uh, you know can detect whether there is dirt in a particular spot and then uh, choose from a set of actions that are adequate for the dirt. The other way is to have a machine that does something very, very simple. And because it is in a particular environment, doing these simple actions in that specific environment end up accomplishing the goal. So uh, this is what I have on the right-hand side here, this fuzz ball, which is basically just vibrates. And if you put it under the bed where the dust bunnies are, this vibration is gonna end up with the floor under the bed being clean. If you put it in the garden among the grass, it's not gonna do anything. So in a very simple, simple sense, bottom-up approach is basically uh, the agent doing some kind of activities and recognizing whether this activity has yielded something good, a good choice, a good moral decision or something bad. So you're just giving it tools to recognize uh, what it has done rather than telling it how to do things. So for explicit agents using the bottom-up approach in order to, um, excuse me, <laughs> for explicit agents using the bottom-up approach in order to build, uh, uh, to build an explicitly moral agent means uh, answering the question, how to build an agent that learns to behave morally. Whereas for implicit agents, so these are the agents that they cannot themselves figure out things, it means answering the questions how to build an agent that given examples of right and wrong learns to make the correct moral choices in a given context. So it's, it's a very much the difference of whether there is an autonomous, some level of autonomous choice into the uh, what is right and wrong, or just being trained to behave within the perfect, the specific um, parameters. Uh, what is the advantages here? What is the idea? Why do we want this at all? Is that people make moral decisions all the time without following a specific moral theory and we would like computer programs to do the same. The strength of the bottom-up engineering lies in the assembly of components to achieve a goal uh, and we want pretty much the same thing here. Uh, it relieves us from this necessity to predict, to choose the right moral theory and to predict all the context in which this um, this uh, machine is going to act. And of course, the idea is that instead of learning how to always be moral, which we don't know necessarily as humans, an artificial agent will learn little by little as people do. This is uh, this actually already occurs in the in one of Turing's paper as an approach to how uh, ethical, oh, sorry, no, intelligent behavior is accomplished. But there is no clear approach that has been put forward how to do this. Uh, so there is no uh, what you would call big net neural networks, deep learning approaches into how to discern right actions from wrong actions. Uh, there are um, approaches that use learning, but they use uh, these approaches such as this. Um, they use inductive logic programming. So it is symbolic learning that is being used even in the bottom up approaches. And I should, of course, mention before um, that in the top down approaches is very much uh, rule-based uh, AI and logic-based reasoning that is being used. There is um, some effort that goes into the line of using reinforcement learning for ethical decision-making, but this is very much uh, in its nascency, I would say, and uh, it has very strong limitations, but people are slowly moving into this direction. But as you can see, it's very, very difficult to kind of use these uh, strengths of current contemporary AI that are deep learning to the problem of bottom-up doing moral reasoning. So what are the limitations and advantages? Uh, the limitations are that there are no safeguards. How do you, uh, how can you make be sure that reasonable behavior will be learned? So if I'm going to use some kind of a, um, uh, learning method, like what guarantees that the end that what is learned to be good behavior and what is learned to be bad behavior is actually what I want, 
what it's going to be the same as what people do. So the example here is the Thai chatbot uh, that Microsoft unleashed upon the Twitter uh, that was supposed to learn how to um, communicate with people. Um, but because some people thought it would be funny to push this uh, learning towards, um, they pushed the, the using the right type of examples, they, they kind of trained this Thai bot to uh, respond in a very xenophobic and racist way. So it, they, it corrupted the behavior of the bot to begin with. And then the question is, like, if you have a system that learns what is right and wrong, if that system is in a situation in which it is being taught or impacted or influenced in a, in a bad way, how do you prevent that from happening? How can we be sure that it's not corrupted either accidentally or deliberately? Again, the bottom-up approach requires hard AI problems to to be solved, like situational awareness, prediction of consequences, learning from the environment. You don't get away from that here, unless you are in a very context, uh, specific context, uh, this, this you have. Then of course, is the question of how to specify the right examples or the right objective function if you're doing reinforcement learning. And this is possibly the re actual reason as to why nobody has used deep learning to approach this problem. Where do you get the data sets from, right? I mean, where do you figure, who, where do you, yeah. Thanks, Giuseppe. I mean, this, I think this is my, one of my last slides. Where do you, um, uh, where do you get the data in order to have supervised learning prediction model built that determines right from wrong? And how do you even represent situations so that you can analyze them in that way? And of course, there's how to verify or prove that ethical behavior really has been reached. So, but the advantages is that it is robust approach. It is supportive of autonomous behavior. You can have more powerful machines that do that, that are not context dependent. And we do not have to worry that we have forgotten to specify some rule because if it is important in the particular society in which this uh, decision-making agent uh, operates, then the environment somehow will enforce it. All right, so one idea just to, to yeah, we'll give you this, one idea as to how to test whether what you have accomplished really is moral behavior or moral decision-making or not that has been put forward is to implement some type of an ethical Turing test. Um, and I will leave you to figure out what that, you, like, you, can, already, you can already imagine what that means actually, but um, uh, the, the, uh, the idea is being, has its defenders, so the, pros and then it has uh, arguments why this doesn't make sense and you cannot actually determine whether true moral behavior has been achieved by using some kind of a Turing test. All right, um, some other specific approaches. We gave a tutorial at, uh, at HK 2020 with Louis Dennis on this and all those things are on YouTube. So Louis talks about specific papers and specific technical details in this. Um, so we just have a look at that and um, give me some grains of salt here of all these. I say there are two approaches, there are two methods, there are two this, all these dichotomies are false. They serve the purpose of making some kind of an order into this field rather and explaining things in a, in a concise way rather than anything else. Okay, so at this point, I will just say thank you and ask if you have any questions. And I'm sorry if I have uh, overdone here the, uh, yeah, the time.